morning is entitled, What to Do When There Is Nothing You Can Do, or How to Handle a Desperate Situation. Let's stand together, please, and we will read from our bulletin. The scriptures are printed in your bulletin. We will read 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. Let's all stand together, please. And it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, with them other beside the Ammonites, came to battle, Jehoshaphat, to battle. Came against Jehoshaphat to battle. And then there came some of the tolls just about the same thing. And come up a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side of Syria. And behold, they be in masses of the ten miles which is in danger. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim the fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord, even now to all the cities of Judah, and came to seek the Lord. Thank you. Be seated, please. What to do when there's nothing you can do? There are some things you can do in certain situations. If you're sick, you can go to a doctor. If you lose your job, you can find another. If you have a flat tire, you can put on the spare. If your house burns down, you can build another. There are some things you can do in certain situations. Somebody wrote, For every evil under the sun, there is a remedy or there is none. If there is one, seek until you find it. If there is none, never mind it. However, there are some things you can't ignore. If you're standing on a railroad track and your foot is caught in the track and there's a train bearing down on you at full speed, you can't ignore that. There are some situations that we are not able to change. Sometimes difficulties come into our lives that we cannot control. We have no control over them. What can we do? For instance, if the state decides to build a freeway through your property, there's nothing you can do about that. You cannot change the laws of your land. You cannot stop a tornado. You cannot reverse the waters of a flood. You cannot save yourself from your sins. You cannot resurrect yourself from the dead. There are some things you cannot do. And yet we are confronted from time to time with situations that require something to be done and there's nothing we can do. It is beyond our ability to do anything about it. What do we do then? At times like that, we want to take matters in our own hands. We want to do something. However, Israel, standing at the Red Sea, they had Pharaoh and his army behind them. They had the mountains on each side of them and the ocean in front of them. And there was nothing they could do. In a few moments, Pharaoh would catch up with them and destroy them. In a few moments, they couldn't climb the sides of the mountains. They couldn't swim through the ocean. Here they're standing at the edge of the water. What can they do? And Moses gets a message from the Lord. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still with our army coming behind me and the mountains on both sides and the river in front of me. Stand still. Yes. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. In other words, stand still and watch what God is going to do. 
And when the Christian gets in a strait and a problem, there are times there's nothing he can do about it. He needs to call on the Lord and stand still and see what the Lord will do. Now we want to take matters in our own hands. At least we like to try to. But when a person is in a strait, an extraordinary difficulty, and he cannot retreat, he cannot go forward, he's shut up on the right hand and on the left hand, what will he do? The Master's word is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But voices will come to him. One voice will say to him, despair. Just lay down and die and give up. You can't handle it anyway. Or another voice comes along called cowardice. And cowardice says retreat. Go back where you came from. The Christian life is something you can't handle. Just go back. Cowardice. Then precipitancy cries out to us, do something, stir yourself, accomplish something. And yet there's nothing we can do. Then presumption comes along and says, if the sea is before you, march into the sea and look for a miracle. Presumption is the wrong voice. And then stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, there are some principles in our story this morning about Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. He was the fourth king of Judah. And he received some bad news. There was nothing he could do about it. And these principles that, Joshua, that Jehoshaphat adopted will help you and help me. What do we mean when we speak of a desperate situation? We mean it's something that's out of our hands. It is completely out of our control, such as grief or a trial or affliction or a marital conflict or something that we cannot control. What do we do? It's a situation where we would have no say-so in the matter. Jehoshaphat received word that there was coming down on he and his people three different armies, all of which were larger than his army. He had no prayer whatsoever, no chance whatsoever of defeating these three mighty nations. The Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites, they were coming. They were armed. They were marching, and soon they would be upon he and his people. What would Jehoshaphat do? A great multitude marching with the intent to destroy every one of them. First, let's look at the desperate situation. Verse 1 and 2. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them beside the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee, an impending attack, an inevitable defeat lay before him. And it's out of Jehoshaphat's control. What will he do? The first thing he did he sought the Lord. Notice verse 3. And Jehoshaphat feared, that is, he worshipped, and set himself to seek the Lord and to proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Notice what Jehoshaphat did. He sought the Lord in prayer. He set himself to seek the Lord. He got down on his knees and he began to pray. He set himself to seek the face of the Lord. That's the first thing he did. And that was a wise thing to do. Anytime that you're faced with a situation like that, go to the Lord. The Lord has the answer. He has the he has
has the ability to take care of it. Somebody said the devil could wall you around, but he can't roof you in. You can pray. Annie Johnson Flint wrote this little poem. Have you come to the Red Sea place in your life where in spite of all you can do, there's no way out, there's no way back, there's no other way but through? Then wait on the Lord with a trust serene till the night of your fear is gone. He will send the wind, He will heap the floods when He says to your soul, go on. And your fears shall pass as your foes have passed. And you shall be no more afraid. You shall sing His praise in a better place, a place that His hand has made. You can pray. The devil can wall you around and hem up your way, but he can't roof you in. You can go through the roof in prayer. Second thing he did, he reflected on the sovereignty of God. He began to think about the kind of God that he worshipped. And he began to remember the things that God had done in the past for him. And we read in verses 5 through 7, And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before a new court, and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art thou not God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Art thou not our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of the land before the people of Israel, and gave it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? What did he reflect upon? The sovereignty of God. He realized that God is a sovereign God, that He holds the nations in His hands, that He is in charge of everything in this universe. There's not a thing in the universe that He does not have under His control. And He began to think, why well, our God is sovereign, He has all power, He can save us, and He prays to a sovereign God. He's like the old black preacher that went to a convention. And he began to tell of all the things the Lord had done. How the Lord delivered Israel at the Red Sea. And how that God sent hailstones on the armies to deliver His people. And how that God sent fire from heaven when Elijah prayed. And he said, what God has done in the past, God is able to do again. And that's true. What is the meaning of divine sovereignty? Divine sovereignty means that God is the absolute and sole controller of the universe. What is the extent of His sovereignty? How far does God's sovereignty extend? It extends to the material world. He made the sun, the moon, the stars. He still controls them. It extends to the spirit world. He is sovereign over Satan, over demons, over men. It extends to the angelic world. He's in charge of the angels, the elect angels and the evil angels. They are under His control. Then it extends to the human world. Men are under His control. It extends to the redemptive world. It extends to the social world. All classes of men, red, yellow, black, or white, they are under His control. It extends to the political world. God raises up kings and puts down kings. So His control and sovereignty extend to all realms of beings and things. In Ecclesiastes 9.1, Solomon said, For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. Now that's a comforting thing to know, that if this train is bearing down on you and you're caught on the tracks and can't get off, 
that there is a God that could stop that train. There is such a God. Though he uses means to accomplish his ends, he accomplishes his purposes. The independence of God extends to the will of God. Daniel said, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? In Isaiah 46, 10, the triune de deity of the Bible declares his sovereignty. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times of things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. I will do all my pleasure. None can stay his hand. No one can stop him from delivering his people. The third thing he did is that he recognized that he had a problem. Most people fail to recognize that they have a problem. And you're never going to get your problem solved until you recognize that you have a problem. When you recognize your problem, then you can take the problem to God. He knows about it anyway, but He wants you to bring it to Him so He can dispose of it. The fourth thing He did was He summarized His own helplessness and His dependence upon God. In verse 12 and 13, He said, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do. But our eyes are upon thee. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones and their wives and their children. They said, Lord, we're helpless. We don't know what to do. We have no might. We have no power. And they're coming down upon us. They'll be here soon. Oh, Lord, what will we do? Have you ever been there? I've been there. I've been there. Lord, what am I going to do? I don't see any way out. Lord, if you don't make a way, I'm a goner. And you know he's never failed to make a way. We had a lady in our church one time, a Thai lady. She was our pianist. And she had a song that she sang a lot. God will make a way. God will make a way. It's a great song. Because He does make a way when we bring our problem to Him. And then there came a divine solution. You know, as long as we think we can handle a problem, God will just let us try to handle it. But when we, like Jehoshaphat, say to God, we have no might, we don't know what to do, Lord, would you save us? He steps in and He saves you. But He wants you to acknowledge to Him that you have no power and you have no might and you have no wisdom. And when you acknowledge that to Him, He's ready to step in and help. Then there came a divine solution. One of the men in the camp, in the congregation, stood forth with a message from God. And you know, I like the idea that it was in the midst of the congregation. If you need help, you know where to find it? Find it in the congregation. God will speak to you in His assembly, in His church. Verse 14. Then upon Jehaziel, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. Notice where it took place. The help came in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken, ye all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you. God will answer you. He'll answer your prayer. He'll answer your cry. He'll answer your call. One of the men stood forth in the congregation and said, Hear the word of the Lord. God always has a man 
And you know where to find the help that you need? You'll find it in God's house. That's how God works. He works through His house and through His people. And then I have you notice they were instructed not to be afraid. Verse 15, Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed, by reason of this great multitude. Don't be afraid of them. He that is with you is greater than they. They can't hurt you as long as I'm behind you. Be not afraid. Then he gave them a reason why they should not be afraid. In verse 15, For the battle is not yours, but God's. The battle is God's. He will win the victory. You can't win it. He will win it. When you turn it over to Him, He will win the victory. The battle is not yours, but God's. If you're a child of God, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've submitted yourself to Him and received Him, if you're a child of the King this morning, the battle isn't yours. It's God's. He fights for His people. And not only that, they were instructed to act in faith. Verse 16, Tomorrow, go ye down against them. March out against that army. Now, I imagine that scared Jehoshaphat half to death. You want me to march out against those three armies? My little army? Yes. March out tomorrow against them. Now, they were to act in faith. They were to go out when God sent them out. And then God knew where the enemy was. He said to them, Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. And I imagine Jehoshaphat was saying, Well, Lord, I'm glad you know where they are, and you've told us where they are, but what good is that going to do us? We can't whip them. God commanded them to go into battle, but He also promised them the victory. Verse 17, Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Did you notice that? Ye shall not need to fight in this battle and stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord with you O Judah and Jerusalem fear not nor be dismayed tomorrow go out against them for the Lord will be with you the Lord will be with you go out tomorrow against them the Lord will be with you now that should have been all Jehoshaphat needed. There was a definite acknowledgement of faith. They believed God. They believed He would keep His Word. We sang a few moments ago, standing on the promises that cannot fail. And that's what Jehoshaphat stood on. They worshipped the Lord and they praised the Lord in song even before the battle was to transpire. Verse 18 and 19, they made a public acknowledgement of their faith in God's promise. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites and the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korharites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. They marched out against the enemy, knowing they didn't have the might to conquer that enemy, yet having the promise of God that they wouldn't even need to fight in the battle, that God was going to give them the victory. And so they lifted up their voices in praise even before they met the enemy. Yes, our God will keep His promises. And so they march out. And King Jehoshaphat exhorted them to believe 
and to obey God. Verse 20, And they arose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. He exhorts the people to believe God, and God will prosper them. And then the king sent out singers before the army to sing praises unto God. And verse 21, when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord and that they should praise the beauty of holiness. And they went out before the army and to say, Praise the Lord for His mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, Notice what happens. Verse 24. From the top of the hill they looked down on the enemy. And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked under the multitude and behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth and none escaped. Every soldier in those three great armies fell dead on the ground. Not a one of them survived. God saw to it that they all died. And Jehoshaphat and his army stood there looking over the brow of the hill upon the dead bodies of their enemy. Did God keep his promise? Yes, he did. Did they have to fight? No, they didn't. All they had to do was have faith and to believe God is a God who never lies and never breaks His word. The victory was accomplished by God. The provisions that they needed were there. They stripped the bracelets and gold off those dead bodies and they had more than they could carry home. They were enriched. Verse 25, And they found among them in abundance both riches with dead bodies and precious jewels. And they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering of the spoil, for it was so much. Now, what is our recourse today? It's the same recourse that Jehoshaphat had. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changeth not. He's the immutable God. And since He doesn't change, since He was for His people in the Old Testament, He is for His people in the New Testament, and He is for His people today. He is for us right now. What is our recourse? What shall we do when we're confronted with a situation where there's nothing we can do? Three or four things in closing. First of all, learn that we do not control our own destiny. Your destiny is in the hands of a sovereign God, the omnipotent God, the God that delivered Jehoshaphat and Judah from those three great armies. That God is your God, and that God never changes, and He controls our destiny. Every step that we take is under His direction. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Learn that we do not control our own destiny and we look to God who controls all things. Jeremiah 10.23 O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. You see, God directs your steps. Psalm 37, 23, And the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. What then shall we do? What is our recourse? Secondly, like Moses at the Red Sea, and Moses said to the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. 
the Lord shall fight for you. And God fought for Israel that day, drowned Pharaoh and his army to the very last man. The second thing is here, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Take this to heart. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. You've got to get that problem out of the way. Lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy path. Take that Proverbs to heart. Thirdly, hear this promise. Isaiah 43. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee, since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. That's to you. That's what God says to you. I love this poem by old William Cowper. God moves in mysterious ways, His wonders to perform. He plants His footsteps on the sea and rides above the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never, escape, never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and will burst with glory on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust Him for His grace. Behind a frowning providence, He hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err, and scan His work in vain. God is His own interpreter, and He will make it. I just thought that might be an encouragement to somebody here today. When you're faced with tragedy and threats and you don't know which way to turn and there's no way out, remember Jehoshaphat. He prayed. He humbled himself. He called on God. He believed God. And God gave the victory. And there was no problem. And that same principle will work for you. It will work for you today, tomorrow, the next day. Every time you have a problem, if it's something you can handle, God expects you to handle it. But if you can't handle it, that was the message this morning. If it's something beyond your ability to handle, then go to Jehoshaphat and remember how God delivered him. And remember that those same promises apply to you in your need. And you can go to your God and He will not fail to deliver you. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Let's Stand together, please, and be dismissed in prayer. I trust this morning that this message, if it's not today, might be a help to you later on. Because you never know from one day to the next when you may need this very advice from God's Word. And it's there for you if you'll just remember to use it. Let's bow together in prayer. And as we pray, 
Uh, this morning I'm going to ask Brother, uh, Brother Ellis, would you please dismiss us in prayer? <laughs>